This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Today I have looking at me on my screen not one but two gaming giants with a combined experience in the video game industry of nearly 80 years. <laughs> Masters of storytelling, cutting edge game engines, gameplay mechanics and genre defining game franchises is a pleasure to welcome Brenda Romero and John Romero. Welcome guys. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Let's go way, way back to the start. Before either of you worked in the video game industry, what were your first experiences of gaming or computers? Let's start with Brenda. Hmm. Uh, well, I started making games, board games, when I was a kid. Um, and So I would just get pieces and parts uh, from yard sales and, and use the backs of like Monopoly boards to make my own games. And I'm sure absolutely every one of them was terrible. Um, <laughs> but I had I loved making them. And then I got D and D when I was about eleven, uh, and that was that was the rule set I needed for my imagination. So I fell headfirst into it. I still have my original copy of D and D, and I, you know, I love that game as much as I. It is some of my fondest childhood memories were spent in make believe worlds. Mm. And is this sort of late mid seventies? What, what sort of time frame are we talking uh, 19, about here? Nineteen. I would have been eleven, so nineteen seventy-seven. Seventy-seven. When I got D and D. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Now, with computers, the first computer that I, that I the, like, I'd seen arcade machines, but the first computer that I ever saw, my mom got me, it was either a VIC-20, I think it was a VIC-20, um, and she also got that. We had no money growing up, so, you know, all of the fact that we even had this used VIC-20 was a, was a miracle, um, but I... I remember just doing the same things that everybody did when they first got a computer or had access to it. You would, if there was a number, you would, you know, you, you print your name on the screen, then you print your name, you know, go to 10 and you print your name, you know, 300 times until you break the program. Right. And, and then, uh, and then you would type in programs from magazines. I'm often curious if I typed in one of John's programs, <laughs> yes, um, yeah. but you would, you would type in a program from a magazine and then you would change the numbers. And so, you know, 90% of the time it would break whatever you did, but you'd start messing around with things. But I, I think the super magic moment for me happened when I first saw the Wizardry logo animate on the screen. I'd never seen anything like that. And to me, it reminds me of the the reactions that people have to VR, you know, where they, they first see VR and they're just like, oh, that's what I was like when I first saw color on a screen, when I first saw things animating. Yeah, that was that was a truly transformational moment for me. There are these real quantum leaps in computing that stick with you, don't they? Things like that, things yeah. like using your first uh, 3D accelerator card and seeing the difference that makes and VR. They're just huge, huge things. Yeah. Um, how about you, John? Let's just go back to how it started with you. Were you uh, a tabletop gamer as well first or was it straight into video games? Um, geez, played lots of board games. You know, our, our family had a closet full of board games played pinball games. This is all in the seventies. Lots of, you know, the pinball. arcade games, lots yeah, of arcade pinball. games, electromechanical games, you know, basically everything when you're a kid and there's these games, obviously you're going to be excited uh, and play them. And then the first time I saw a computer was in 1979, but it was at the university and it was a mainframe. So that was, that was a very different kind of computer than personal computers, which had just appeared. Um, but those computers were in stores like Radio Shack and, and other local businesses. And uh, eventually we got a computer at home in 1982. And then I could just code on that, that you know, all the time uh, and just start making games. So, yeah, my, my exposure what computer was, was that out of interest. It was an Apple II Plus. That was an Apple, Apple II, II Plus okay. computer. Yeah, really great computer. OK, because I've heard in the past, I've heard both of you use the word obsession just to describe your love of coding and brenda i've heard you describe the apple II as your first real boyfriend um, it was, it was. <laughs> it, it was. so once first you were husband. both first first <laughs> husband first the husband, apple II. Yeah. <laughs> so once you were both bitten by the coding bug was there ever any other career path that you might have considered taking or were you do you think you were destined to be game designers for life like john would there ever have been I don't know, John the train driver, or was this just your destiny? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was actually, I used to draw all the time. 
So I was I was going down the art path, and uh, and then programming happened, and then it was like, um, this is unbelievable. Like this is super super fun. The results are immediate, um, and you know, drawing is not going to make a game happen, but programming will. So I, that's why I was really excited about programming because I could actually make a game that way. So that's the path I took, which was coding. You know, programming in BASIC, and then in 1983, learning uh, 6502 assembly language. Okay. I mean, obviously coding, very technical thing, but were you able to still express yourself artistically, being an artist through coding? Did you find ways to do that, or did that come later as you got better at it? Uh, well, yeah, you have to, because when you're the only person making a game and it has art in it, <laughs> you're drawing the art. <laughs> you know, like there yeah. was no internet to download art from, so you make your own art and you make your own sound and you have to write the code that actually puts the art on the screen and you have to write the code that actually can generate sound um, and you have to design it and you have to make it fast enough and it's like it's a ton of stuff to learn and uh, and that was all just super fun to do like learning about all of that stuff yeah yeah how about you brenda was there an alternative career path that you might have taken well, I, I had gone to college. I mean, um, John was fortunate in that he grew up in an area where computers w existed. I mean, John also grew up, uh, you know, uh, he, John was also from a lower income family, also had a, a, a you know, pretty difficult upbringing. Um, but he and he, I should say not but he and he was in he was in California, you know, so he he was there to see all this happen. I was in Northern New York where the <laughs> primary industry was dairy. Right. Unbelievably, Surtech opened there, but I still, I didn't have, there were, there was nobody around me. I didn't, I knew one other person who knew how to code. Uh, and he was a savant, really a literal yeah. savant when it comes to code. And, and he doesn't have time for this, you know, 15 year old, he had to make games. He was like on deadlines. He didn't have time for this 15 year old curious kid. Right. But but I did at least I had access to these computers and I I didn't end up going the same route with John I I I also I also got as far as assembly language but in early college for me the writing and design portion of it really took off I've always loved writing um, regardless of regardless of its form so it, and I also love I love building things with my hands now that said code is super fun but. Code is super fun, and in fact, my retirement game, whenever I retire, is going to be a 6502 game for the Apple II, just because I never did it. Everybody else I know, everybody else is from, you know, where I'm from that time in the industry has done that, and I feel like I got all the other achievements for this game of game development, but I left out the release a game in 6502 <laughs> on the Apple II, and so I will, I can't die without the set complete, so I have to do that. Um, but for me, the, the design bug really took off. It, you know, it, it really took off. And some of my greatest moments in making games literally involved me getting my hands dirty. Um, and I don't mean that in the figurative sense. I mean, you know, building boards and, and um, uh, you know, building out my non-digital games. So I, and, and I had, I also, I discovered the wizardry editor, which was probably my downfall. So this is earlier than, you know, earlier than, than well, I mods, you know, people would take people's games and make changes to them. But the wizardry editor was something that was only available in Surtech and allowed us to make, uh, allowed us to make wizardry levels. And so I just became obsessed with this thing. And I, I took a, I took a wrong turn, I guess, when I was in college, you know, I just, I didn't see code as the way to make new games. I was fascinated with code but because I because I hadn't gotten to the level with assembly language, anything that I was create and I didn't I, I finally was able to take assembly language in like my second or third year of college. Anything that I was creating was in was in basic or in Pascal. And it was like the basic stuff. Like I would compare what I was doing to what, say, Nasser Jabelli or Bill Budge were doing. Right. And like I couldn't even understand how I didn't even I was incapable of under, like I see that on the screen. I don't know what wizardry they're causing. I don't know what's making that happen. Um, but I don't have any regrets about that. You know, like I, I really enjoy design and I really enjoy design direction. And I love, like at this point in time, I love writing, but even with all the, with all the higher level stuff that has to happen in directing a game, I don't have time to do the writing. And so I have a team of full-time writers 
that does it. You know, I, I love what I do. I love what I do. And I don't have any regrets, except I have to release a game in 6502 on the Apple II. It doesn't even matter what the game is. I'll make it a good game, but I have to do that. <laughs> yeah, but there's a huge, a huge uh, retro market at the moment who would love a 6502 game to play on the Apple II. So we're all waiting for you, Brenda, whenever you want to do that, make that game. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned that you were just 15 when you started at, at Surtech. Uh, yeah. But you were facing some stiff competition from John for the badge of coolest kid because, John, I understand when you were 15, you were writing software for the Air Force. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, it was funny. Yeah, when I got to school, I basically uh, wanted to take the programming class, and the teacher had, I had to prove to the teacher that I knew how to code and that I wouldn't be left behind if I joined the class. So I, I showed her that I knew assembly language, which they were not doing. <laughs> and then the next morning, she basically took me out of class and drove me across the base to the aggressor squadron and introduced me to a captain there who then took me into the classified vault and asked me if I knew how to program this mini computer, which was a Chromemco mini that, that was there. I was like, yeah, it uses HP basic and it's CPM. Sure. Okay. <laughs> then, Are your and lips then they sealed? Can you, can you tell us what it was for, what it was all about or not? No, I can't. It's oh. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep that air of mystery. Yeah, his stepdad worked for the military, so that's why he was on the base. And as part of his work, that they, they made sure that John was coding real things, but all of the data was fake, and then other programmers would come in after it, you know, put the proper data in there. But, yeah, that's I don't have anything that's... I don't have anything that's that cool, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, you were doing a cool job at 15. Um, I sure was. I understand you were working on the helpline, is that right? Helping? I started, yeah, so that was, which is ridiculous, like I, that, I, that I got paid to play games, really. Um, especially, like, I was 15. Who would, and the, the alternative was hardcore, like, farm work, which I had also <laughs> done. And since... <laughs> Since I spent time working on a farm, I can comfortably say I have never worked a day in my life. Like that is that is real work there. Um, but I yeah, so people would call. This is pre-internet days. How do you get to the wizard on the tenth level? And I still remember. I remember all of those. All, the answers to all of those questions still like they're permanently etched in my brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's I, nothing about wizardry that I do not know. Was <laughs> there? Was there a really common question that you would always be asked on that helpline? How help do you line? get to the wizard on the that, that's level? The, that's the most really? common one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, do you want to know how? <laughs> you, have to get, you have to go you take the elevator from the first floor to the fourth floor. There's Then you have to go to the monster control center, which is down the hall, around the corner, and go through that door that's there. It's the second door that's on your right. And uh, defeat the monster center there at the back of the room. There's a secret <laughs> door, which will get you the blue ribbon. You go out the secret door that way, all the way to the end of the hall. There's an elevator that will take you to the ninth floor. On the ninth floor, you walk out of the elevator. There's going to be a door on your left. In the far corner of that room, there will be a teleporter that will take you to the 10th level. That will lead you to a series of seven hallways of seven rooms. When you get to the seventh hallway in the seventh room, you'll beat Wardna, and that will win you the game. Hey, amazing. Tons of amazing. that. My whole head, my whole head is, not my whole head. <laughs> like <hope>. some, <laughs> some module of my head is reserved for, for just that. endless yeah. wizardry <laughs> trivia. Presumably this was a premium rate number, so you might have talked a little bit slower. No, no, <laughs> it wasn't. No, no, no. No, that was actually, before they could I'd, make money on it. <laughs> oh, no, okay. No, I mean, I speak fast because I'm from New York and I have four shots of espresso in the morning. But no, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a premium number, actually. And in, it, if people wrote in, we actually had all these photocopied pieces of paper that we'd send to them with the answers. Oh, OK. So, OK. So, was, yeah, I would have loved to have worked at Surtech back then. <laughs> well, I, I'm looking for, I'd love to find uh, times when your paths may have crossed. So in, in sort of 1981, might, well, you got your first computer in 82, didn't you, John? Yeah. So yeah. might you have been playing Wizardry in 82? Did you fire yeah. that up? Can you remember? Yeah, definitely. You did? Oh, okay. absolutely. Yeah. That was, that, the, yeah, color, was the color and everything. Yeah, it was, it was one of the biggest games ever made back then. It was huge. But you didn't call the helpline. Yeah. Uh, no. Nope, did not call a help. I actually, the only time I called a helpline was in 1990, playing um, Secret of Monkey Island, and I was oh, stuck okay. in one specific location, and uh, it, it was it was kind of one of those cheap puzzles that they throw in there to make you call. <laughs> and uh, and say, so Brenda, you're you're working on the helpline, but presumably this was an environment where you would you weren't just taking phone calls because. 
that curiosity in gameplay and game mechanics must have been bubbling up and they must have recognized that there because your role evolved how did how did you progress there at Certec? Yeah, well, they knew I was. They knew that I, I mean, they knew that I loved games. I, I, I don't know that I would have gotten the job if I hadn't, you know, the questions when they were talking about the availability of this job were, had I heard of Certec, which was no. Had I heard of Wizardry, which was also no. Had I heard of, Cert, uh, had I played Dungeons and Dragons? And I had, okay. you know, I was a DM at that point in time. And so that was that was the the interview i could have just you know started screaming at that point and i'm pretty sure i would have gotten the job um but wh- how it progressed i really i it's interesting because i haven't i don't think i've ever said this before because i don't think it's ever been framed as as you just framed it but i think how it progressed is down to you coming from a low income family and my mother right. right so my mother give my mother any job if she gets in anywhere she was going to, what is the next plus one step of where this is? So she's hired at Hackett's Hardware. It's a craft department. Okay, great. It, it didn't need any improvement. It was already running. But she thought, what if I put finished examples of all these things up? I bet people would buy them. What if I offered little workshops on how these people could do these things? And so my mother was always a plus one type of person. So for me, it was great. I've got this job and I'm already here but I want your job. I want to do that next thing. How could I make this one step better? And my brother also, uh, my brother's a professional musician. Uh, you know, and he's played with, he's played with a lot of big names and I saw the dedication. My brother played guitar eight hours a day and then he, every day, and then he went to do whatever he was doing. And so, you know, for me, it was always about how can I get better? And realistically, it, this is, um, a lot about games is known now. You know, I think about kids who are just coming, you know, who are in high school and they're thinking about what they want to do for a living. And they have they have the design patterns of World of Warcraft, which is like at least five genres smashed into one, right? Mm-hmm. At least. They, and, and it's such an evolved game at this point in time. They have, genres exist. We, we have first person shooters. We have 4X games. Like we have loads of things. When John and I started in the industry, it was the time of Cambrian explosions. Dinosaurs are walking the earth. You know, volcanoes are exploding. <laughs> it is everywhere we look is opportunity, right? And it is impossible not to be interested because it's this is the time when everything is happening. Like, And it was such, you know, nowadays we'll look at games like Hades and we'll go, oh, my God, well done. That was great, you know, but. I can't even tell you what a horror it was to be a game developer in 1993 because 1993 was the year that two games came out, which no matter what you were doing, you were behind, which was Myst and Doom. Yeah. Mm. And so everybody who was not working at id or Cyan at the time was just like, Jesus Christ. Like it was such a step forward, such a step forward that whatever you were doing was already outdated. And so it was the excitement that existed in the industry. And I I do feel funny enough, I feel like we're nearly back at that right now because we have finished the graphics arms race is over, right? There are some really cool things. I've just recently played something in VR that I was like, that is super cool. I can't, it's not, it's not out yet. So I can't even talk. It's not even announced. I can't talk about it, but I'm like, please. I was, I was like, can I keep, please kind of keep playing this. No, we have to take away the dev access. God damn it. You know, <laughs> um, but it, it, we're starting to see like l- it, people are creating independent of the graphics arms race or independent of the, we need like in the nineties, it was, I remember making RPGs and it's like, we need 70 hours of gameplay, right? Like, so the, the hours arms race. And now we're seeing like smaller games, like if found by dream feel that, that you know it's that game is not about the graphics arms race it's not about let me make the longest game ever but it's like we have a there's this is a very this is a unique mechanic and we are really going to try to cash the check on that mechanic and we're going to tell a story that hasn't yet been told and so we're starting to see games it's about design. deeper yeah we're getting games getting deeper and broader and uh in in now you know, whereas when I made Train or even like the um, uh, the uh, No Russians uh, in Modern Warfare, um, uh, we're starting to see games becoming, you know, 
talking about subjects that that every other form of literature, every other form of media has been talking about for you know decades, but that's still pretty new ground for games. You know, games. Are, I really believe deeply that games are the greatest art form ever. I know it's a broad statement, but you know, like I, I have a bookshelf. There's books over here on this side. None of these books can take me on a trip that I can influence. Mm. Um, it's pandemic times, um, so you can see only one piece of artwork that's there that's leaning against the wall because our walls are stone here, so I don't have the tools to put it up. But that, that artwork, it's beautiful. I can't wait till it's hung, but it's not taking me on a trip anywhere. I won't be able to say, I won't be able to have my unique experience with it, right? Like I won't, I cannot change that painting. I could, I could, I won't, because I won't do that, but I could. But, you know, I really think games, games are a unique experiential art form. That's interesting because quite often when I talk to people on these chats, they, they say that it's actually the limitations of the older systems that force them to be more creative. But you're saying, well, actually, you know, on the 3D graphics front, we've completed that. We, we've reached a level where you can do anything you want. And that unlocks the creativity. Is, is that what I'm hearing? I don't see. I mean, I really think the human imagination is the limit, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I... I think we can, like, if we take a look at, there's some games that are graphically, like, I'll, I'll use this, uh, Ghost Recon Breakpoint. John plays a hell of a lot of that. Shockingly beautiful game. Incredibly beautiful game. Um, take a look at, uh, you know, games that have unique mechanics, like, say, If Found, or, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening in Hades, and, you know, a lot of that is down to its creative direction in the writing there. Um, but we still have loads of stuff. Like, pro the game... Funny enough, as a, as a lifelong career as a game developer, I would say the game that most influenced the BAFTA I got was a game that didn't even have a computer, right? That, that, I, that I could have made, you know, easily. Well, there's no way I would have known how to make that game. Um, but, you know, the, the games that I, I suspect I will be, you know, will, will be like somebody stacks my ludography in terms of what mattered the most. And so, actually... If we look at just any academic reference, the game of mine that is most often referenced by far is Train. Just because nobody had done something like that before. I didn't need a computer to do that. I, you know, I, that was just purely down to human imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, let's wind back to about 1987, because here we find John working at Origin Systems. So can you just fill us in quickly on, on how your career sort of started and got you to that point at Origin? Could you just run us through that? Because there was mention of magazine listings earlier. Is that how it started for you? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the first thing that was that I published, that a, a game I had published, I wrote the game in 83 and got it published in a magazine in 1984. And I published lots of stuff in magazines um, and on disc, etc. So by the time I got out of high school, I'd already published many games. So mm -hmm. a couple of years out of high school is when I finally... Uh, got my first industry job, which was at Origin Systems in New Hampshire. And my job was to port this game called uh, 2400 AD. It was an RPG. And funny enough, I was just talking to the author of that game yesterday <laughs> over mm -hmm. Zoom. Um, but yeah, it was it was my first job at uh, in the industry. It was porting it from the Apple II to the Commodore 64. Um, so that was, you know, that was really fun. And one night while I was there, um, the CEO of the CEO of um, of Surtech uh, and Brenda came down to basically show yeah. off show off the latest uh, wizardry game. And uh, Rob Surtech was there, and it was like nine o'clock at night, and he was showing off the latest Ultima, which is Ultima Five. And I was there. It was just me, just Rob and I. I was doing my own thing. He was there waiting for this this meeting and then um rob and brenda come in and say hi and uh rob's uh Ro it's funny because they're both named robert um <laughs> rob uh needed me to to come and help get this computer running so i came over and got the disc in it and booted it up and said hi to brenda and you know, rob Sirotech and um and that's how we met Okay, so that's the first time you, you met. Yeah, um, that's interesting met. because yeah. Ultima was obviously a big competition for wizardry, but yeah. these yeah. guys are coming straight into the heart of Richard Garriott and Rob, Robert Garriott's company and yeah. saying, here's what we're making. 
Um, the industry was what, very close back then. Like everybody okay, yeah. knew everybody else, like like friends. Yeah. So this yeah, and to this to this day, sometimes people say like, you know, so and so, and it's like it's like it was the tiniest neighborhood when we got into <laughs> games, and those of us who remain absolutely know each other. Yeah. I did. I was very surprised once when John and I went to GDC, and I found out that he didn't somehow he had never met Will Wright. Which surprised me because they have similar back, like they were both 6502 fanatics, and yeah. I was just surprised. But I would say, with that singular exception, I think everybody knows everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, I, I've had the pleasure of speaking to Richard Garriott in a previous interview, and um, the company there did foster an impressive roster. They had yourself, Chris Roberts, Warren Spector, Martin Goway, many, many other people there. And Richard attributed the the company's ability to attract talent like you down to what he said was a good royalty deal for developers and a very author oriented environment. Is that how you remember Origin being? What was it like working there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so when I worked there, that was totally, my situation was very different than what Richard's talking about. Um, okay. Back in the industry, when publishers started, they basically made their money off of indies. So indies would write a game at home and they would submit it to a publisher. Publisher publishes it and they have a good royalty deal, right? And then they get royalty checks every quarter, et cetera. Uh, my job was an actual staff job. I was on staff every day in, in and this is this was not a usual thing at companies back in the 80s like to be on staff in a company um mm -hmm. making games was actually not the norm the norm was for indies to send their stuff in to get published so i was staff because um i guess because of porting because i was doing a port um they in in also in the late 80s game companies were beginning to try to get their in-house staff built up so they didn't rely on random games coming in from outside. They started to get an idea of like, you know, what about franchises and growing these growing these games to make a sequel and stuff. And you want the the, um, the institutional knowledge to carry on from, from game to game. And you want that, you know, you gotta keep these people, which means they should be employees. So they were starting to build um, teams. And that's why I was there. I was there mainly to do ports, but I was also working on original stuff as, as well. Um, so I had no royalty deal because I did not independently make a game and submit it to, to Origin. Okay, okay. But you haven't got anything bad to say about working at the company. It was a night. It was a dream work working at Origin. Kids. Richard and Rob are amazing. Um, everybody I worked with was great. You know, I worked with just a lot of people in that office. Or there were actually a lot of people in that New Hampshire office. Uh, from the QA team that was there, amazing QA. The people on the production line putting the boxes together were great. You know, copying discs and getting stuff in boxes, and um, that that was the day where all the the cool feely stuff was in the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, little tool toolkits for Auto Duel and all that stuff. Um, everybody was awesome at that company. I loved it. Mm -hmm. It was it was just I, that that was just like the last the the only place I ever wanted to work, and I got my first job there. It was amazing. Fantastic. And then left. And then, and then I left because I I wanted to start my own company with someone that I really respected, who was Excellent. my boss. The we'll guy who hired me. We'll come on to me. that shortly. We'll come on to that shortly. That's a that's a question I've got coming up. But uh, we've got the first viewer question here, which comes from Alex, and he he wants to know. We'll go off on a tangent here. What films did you enjoy as kids that might have influenced your games? Well. All of them, <laughs> Star all Wars, them. <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars, you know, um, all of them. I so used much... to watch scary movies all the time. Yeah. Okay. Like so you were Fridays and Saturdays. Fan. Yeah. When it was Friday and Saturday night in Northern California, um, there was a TV channel that basically would own like creature features kind of thing. And I would turn off all the lights. My parents would go to sleep early. I turn off all the lights and I just watch whatever horrible, insane thing was, you know, <laughs> Friday the 13th or Halloween or I just can't like, believe you got away with that. Loved it. Even 50s, <laughs> no chance. 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, all the supernatural movies, you name it. I watched everything. And I had a like a real cinephile friend who knew everything about them as well. So we'd, we'd, I'd go to his house also. Um, but yeah, I grew up watching all that stuff and playing arcade games. It was perfect. Well, we can see plenty of influence from, from horror <laughs> films in, in your games. How about you, <laughs> yeah. you Brenda? Yeah. Can you remember any? 
I not not films specific. No, not films for me. The influence uh, when, uh, unlike John, well, there's zero chance my mother would have allowed me to watch. <laughs> like I didn't get to watch. I was well in the industry by the time I was allowed to watch horror films. Um, but I my influences really come just purely from board games and the in the act of creation. I think like when I got out of school. Now this is prior to having a computer. Uh, when I got out of school, the most exciting thing I could think of doing was writing, you know, and I remember like getting together with my friends and, you know, we would specifically pick out certain paper, like we were very specific about the paper, what could be on the paper, how the lines had to be, whether the paper was colored or not, um, <laughs> and just writing. We would get, to, we, were su we were super excited to get together to do that, to just really create stories and create, uh, you know, follow our characters and see what they were doing. So for me, the, the references like Edgar Allan Poe, um, I read a lot of, um, I read, it got heavily into the uh, American beat authors, John Steinbeck, Hemingway, Faulkner. Um, so that's really more, in, but Dungeons and Dragons, like the second I fell into that book, the world outside ended, like anything else I care about, you know, and I, it wasn't the funny thing about it was it's like I Dungeons and Dragons had it not been for the weird maligning that happened during the, the late seventies and eighties. What a, what a tremendous, what a tremendous tool for educators. Like, you know, let's put, let's, you need to know enough about a setting to create a playable space within it. Right. Instead, they, you know, they, instead, you know, they, they, people hooked onto the fact that, oh my God, there's demons in the games. Kids are getting possessed. What will we do? You know, what they had 1993 showed them just how exciting that could be. But um, yeah. And for me, the, the it's, it's Dungeons and Dragons and other forms of literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as we go to the end of the eighties, then um, John, you've moved from origin to, I think soft disc publishing. Is, is that right? And you wrote a game called Slorax uh, where you hired a young <laughs> John Carmack, how did you find John to hire and, and what was the process? Did he have to come and prove himself or did you already know him from working together? Uh, so let's see, when I left um, Origin, I started another company. It was my second game company and I did the Might and Magic port uh, from the Apple to the Commodore. And uh, after, after like I worked on a contract that got killed and I decided, wow, the 8-bit industry is finished. Like it's, 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 it's not happening anymore. I needed to move to the PC, which I actually hated, but like I needed to, <laughs> I needed to make games and that's where it was going to happen. So um, a friend of mine was going down to uh, Softus to interview. And I thought, well, why don't I go down there as well? I mean, it's a place where I can code. And I basically called Softdisk and I said, I want to talk to the president. <laughs> <laughs> and so they they put the president on the phone and I told him my name and he'd already heard about me and he wanted to fly me down for an interview. So I was like, well, this is the best thing ever. So um, so he flew he flew me down. He flew down my friend, too. I told him, well, I'm, I'm with another a, a really great coder here. And so he flew my friend down. Uh, and me and we had a really great weekend and they just hired all three of us my friend that already had gone down there and us too um so while while i was at soft disk it was probably um about a year into it when i decided that i needed to like be making games on a full-time basis so they decided to make a um a division called gamers edge that i would run and i needed to build a team and for the team i needed to I needed a programmer, another programmer to work with, and an artist. And uh, on the Apple II, in the Apple, I was I was doing PC stuff at that time. In the Apple II department, because they were still doing Apple II stuff, um, they had lots of people who would send their games and stuff in that got published. And one of the games had recently been been published on a disc that I had one of my games published on. And I noticed it because he, we were on the same disc. And it was a game that John Carmack had written. And just from running the game, you could tell how well programmed it was. And and I knew that that is some really good code. Like whoever wrote that is, is really good. Is there any way to hire him? And they said, uh, nah, he's, we've tried to hire him twice already. He's not interested. And I just said, get him on the phone. I guarantee he will come here. If I talk to him, he's coming here. So 
they contacted John. He came down for an interview and he was very excited to join the, the company because he would get to make games all day and he'd get to work with people that he felt could help him make really great games. So John came down and he wrote a game before I could get the room for the office. I had him working on whatever he wanted to make. Just make a game, but for the Apple II, because we don't have your PC yet. So we made an Apple II game called Catacomb, gave it to the Apple II department. We got our room, and we got our 386-33s. And then his, uh, his first game was a PC port of Catacomb that he had just written. And then my first game was a, a PC port of a game called Dangerous Dave that I had written two years earlier. And those two games were on the same disc, and we had to make them in a month. So John and I had to make both of those games in one month and get them on a disc and get them out as demonstrations of this new disc that we were starting. And right after that was when John uh, and I, we wrote uh, Slordax. It says Slordax by John Carmack, just I guess because at that time didn't know like what would he put on it or actually maybe the art department put that on there. Um, but we were all making the game together. So Tom Hall had a part in that. I did. John did. So all three of us made that game. The de department made it. Uh, and the art department said by John Carmack on the title screen. <laughs> but that was <laughs> that was that was the first game that we actually made together, which was Slordax. And a lot of stuff happened in September when that game was made. That's how we software was born that month when a lot of stuff happened. Yeah, so I understand uh, Dangerous Dave comes up in that process. Dangerous Dave and uh, in copyright infringement was the game where you um, created a, a game or an engine that had smooth horizontal scrolling, which seems like a minor thing these days, but that was huge. That was a big deal on the PC mm -hmm. back then. Yeah, yeah. Huge step. Yep. Um, and, and this was a breakthrough that you did in your spare time, but using their computers, the company computers. Is that right? Uh, no, this was done. Uh, this was done by John Carmack. So that was done when, by John. Okay. so when John and I started to work together, we had to make sure that we weren't stomping on each other when we we're going to code. Uh, when we we're going to make a game together, we can't be working on the same thing. So I asked him, "What? What are you interested in?" And he said he was interested in graphics and game architecture. And I said, "Okay, I'll do all the other stuff." So John's focus was on game programming uh, in graphics. So I gave him a book that Michael Abrash had written and he studied that book, which had all the answers to the world in it, <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> and he stayed while he was making Slordax, which is a vertically scrolling Xevious type clone, um, which which the PC still had not seen, but, but vertical scrolling is not as impressive as the horizontal scrolling. So he figured out how to do the horizontal scrolling, stayed up one night till five in the morning with Tom Hall, they replicated the first level of Super Mario Brothers three, but with Dangerous Dave as a jump, you know, character because I had just animated it and everything. And then I saw it the next day, and when I ran it, I just I was so blown. I've <laughs> never been blown away in my life by anything. Um, but not even like seeing Pac Man was amazing, but it, it didn't blow me away like this. This was there was nothing like this, uh, which is why I was blown away. <laughs> so I couldn't work for like three hours. Like it was that I was like life changing, and uh, and and when they came in, I was just like, "We're leaving. <laughs> right. This is so unbelievable. Like, you we're, can't have this. <laughs> we're gone. Yeah, because <laughs> it would be wasted at this company. Um, but we did. But but that work was done in the company. It was done on their computers for their games. Um, but it was only when we decided to make our own game that we started taking those computers home. Uh, you know, after uh, on the weekends. Right. So they were okay about it. They didn't try to make a claim that, well, you made this on our computers. This is this code is our property or they didn't push back. Well, the, well, they they didn't know that we were doing that until we launched the game. And then we <laughs> basically told them what we did because we we're going to leave. And then we had to make a deal with them because we made the game on their computers. We don't want them to have a file a copyright claim and go to court. So if they don't do that, we will work for them for a year and make games every two months for a whole year to supply the disc that I started <laughs> with with games so they can bring an internal team up to speed with our tech and just keep uh, on making okay. stuff. So we did that. We worked for a whole year making games for them and we were also making games for ourselves at the same time. So we made 10 games in 1991. A small price to pay for the, for the career that it launched, surely. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, so we're coming into the early 90s now. Um, and at this point, Brenda, I've heard you speak before in other um, interviews about, um, about a female tax uh, and how at this time you started to be on the receiving end of, of quite condescending, sometimes absurd questions, and, and hopefully this isn't going to be one of them. Um, did either of you consider a lack of diversity to be a problem in the early days or in this period of the industry, or did you encounter problems because of attitudes in the industry in the 80s? Wait, what 90s? time are we talking about? Talking about through the 80s and, and the early 90s when you raised that the, you start to have to face this female tax? Well, I would say, so back, so when we're talking about the late 80s, at this point in time, the average, in the US anyway, the average graduating class from computer science was 37% female. So there, there were a fair number of women that were in the industry at the time. And you also have to bear in mind that, you know, the graphic fidelity through the late 80s and early 90s is really just, you know, it's, it's not terribly exciting. So whatever you see that's going to be, you know, titillating isn't, we're talking just very few pixels, right? So um, I guess, you know, certainly once we get into the 90s, that's no longer the case. But, you know, yeah, of course I noticed it. So let me tell you how I noticed it, because I couldn't play as a female character. If you could choose to play a character in a game, you could not choose a female character. And nothing says you don't belong here, like not being able to play somebody who looks like you or where every single end to the game assumes that I want to take off with, you know, the hot chick. Um, and I don't want to take off with a hot chick. Uh, so, so there's you, and you could play as like a crocodile, a dog, a sneaker, <laughs> snake. You could play like a, a tank. You could play You could play as a ghost as long as it was a male ghost. You just couldn't play as a female character, right? And, you know, this is this extends up through the history of games. Uh, anybody who's considered an other, you know, if you if you Google game protagonist, odds are you're going to get a white guy, slightly shaven beard uh, off like this light brown to dark brown hair and a scar somewhere in his face or some weird fig feature on his face. So cosplayers will have something to do, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, certainly I noticed it. Right. And then yeah. when we start getting into, once we start getting into as graphical as the graphic, the fidelity of the graphics improves, then you start seeing guys go into dungeons, uh, you know, fully clad and, and plate mail top to bottom and women are going in there, you know, in, in their best stripper attire, you know? So like, of course, like that, that feels, it feels weird. And it's not to say that there's necessarily anything wrong with it, right? Like, like if I do want to go into a dungeon in a chainmail bikini, more power to me. But if I don't, like, I should have other options. But, but you know, players didn't necessarily have that. Yeah. And where we had female characters in games, they were, you know, often fulfilling trope-like roles. So, or, or I would say most notably, like, I remember the the box for Laura Croft, the original Laura Croft Tomb Raider box, the boobs are embossed. Like, come on, you know, like, that's just stupid. Yeah. Um, so at, at the but, time, uh, did either of you... It's changed, fortunately. Yeah. Did either of you, as game designers at that time, did you ever find yourself in a, in a meeting or considering with your colleagues, well, maybe Commander Keen should have an option where you can choose a female character or perhaps women in wizardry should wear more practical armor that you would want to go into battle in. Can you ever remember these being a consideration in the game planning back then? No, not for uh, our games. It's called Commander Keen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sure. at, okay. at that time, like with the wizardry series, so that would have been David Bradley at the helm right through wizardry seven. Um, I feel like the game didn't have too many tropes. Uh, but, but I, but I'm sure it did, you know, like the, you know, the prime character of the game by Domina, um, you know, she's, you know, she's walking around, you know, dressed, uh, fortunately not super provocatively, but, um, it wasn't, uh, I don't start working. I don't like one of the first games, I don't even like to talk about this game, but I remember, you know, it was definitely, there was a storyline with, you know, male and female characters. And because there was a, because basically there was a problem with, they didn't have enough time to do all the animation for all the female characters that were in the game as well. They literally cut the storyline in half with like two months to go, destroyed the game, whatever. You know, I mean, just to take any book off the shelf and cut half the characters. It, out of it. it got rid of the female characters in the game. Yeah. It was a super hack job. 
Um, so they just made so, yeah, animating the female characters a lower priority to animating No, they got the rid of the characters. female characters. <laughs> they got rid of the female characters entirely, yeah. Oh, it's just stupid. But, yeah, so I, I I certainly make it a priority. Like, if you look at Empire of Sin, Empire of Sin has got a great cast of characters, you know, a, a, a wide variety of characters. Um, you know, I think it's important, and, and the cast will continue to expand uh, so that hopefully it will, you know, when you think of who you are and who you want to play, you can look there and see yourself see yourself somewhere in that cast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then uh, we'll push on into the 90s then. We've got Wizardry 6, Bane of the Cosmic Forge in 90, Wizardry 7 in 92. Um, did you ever get Wizardry fatigue, Brenda? Because you know, you're, <laughs> you're up to seven games now. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I have had few love affairs in my life like I had with Wizardry. Um, I could still, with my eyes closed, play the whole of Wizardry 1. I know that game that well. We... I believe John and I know in seven Apple twos, none of which run um, because, well, because, <laughs> because they're ancient at this point. <laughs> um, but I, you know, the sound of wizardry booting up the sound of the disc drive starting. I, I know all of that, you know? Um, I, so no, you know, it's like, like, do I, John and I spend all of our time together. Do I ever get tired of being with John and look forward to, you know, doing something else? No, you know, cause I, I, He's, you know, he's my best friend, and we love hanging out together. In Wizardry, I had the same kind of relationship with Wizardry. And the, the original designers of the series, Robert Woodhead and Andrew Greenberg, were significantly gifted individuals. I remember I, <laughs> Robert Woodhead and I met for dinner, and John came along. And I since have reframed that to the, when John Romero had a date with Robert Woodhead. <laughs> um, they uh, they talked until, oh, Jesus, 1 o'clock in the morning, yeah, was it? Yeah, it was awesome. Oh, my God. John doesn't often meet people who who are as passionate about 6502 as he is. And, you know, Robert was a kindred spirit boy. It was a fantastic, a fantastic evening. And then Andrew Greenberg, who w- worked with Robert on those early games. And then David Bradley, who was just, a, you know, I, he, I, I, I call David my mentor because I've studied, I've studied every single molecule of the, of his work in the wizardry games and had to, in order to, you know, create the storyline from Wizardry 8, which was finishing off those two. So I was super fortunate to have seen all of those things happen. Now, at the end of Wizardry 8, there was some really, everybody had it. Like, I don't want to sound like there was a design for Wizardry 9. Everybody had their own ideas. And because it was heading out, like I had written up, like, okay, basically everything we couldn't do, I was stuffing into a document about what I would do. You know, eventually, had had Wizardry Nine happened, I'm sure there would have been a team that would have gotten together, and half of those things would have been crossed out. And um, but everybody, everybody, any player, any fan has their ideas about what a series could do, and and I was no different. Uh, but when Wizardry Eight finished, that was for me. I I started uh, when Wizardry Eight was was heading into the tra- you know launch trajectory. I already knew that I I was done with swords. Right. Like okay. I, I was done making a game with swords. Now this turns out to be a complete lie because the game that follows on to that was uh, a Dungeons and Dragons game, but that you know you're you're going right to the heart of the matter there with D and D, right? So there's no good geek that's going to turn down that opportunity. And it was it was an enjoyable opportunity. There was some, as there always are, there's some pretty unique unique twists that that game took. Um, <laughs> but then that was the end but, of swords, yeah, right? <laughs> that was that was the end of swords. Yeah, and I haven't, I haven't gone back to swords since then. And even every once in a while, uh, you know, somebody will say like, "Oh, why don't you make a traditional RPG with?" And even like the RPGs that I did work on, they were always weird. Like we had vending machines in them, and like Wizardry Eight, like I, Wizardry Eight, you crash on this planet, right? And there's there's you know these these rhinoceros looking guys with swords and plate mail crash in their spaceship. <laughs> this is fine. Like it's just. <laughs> So we made very space opera games anyway. So I'm, yeah, I haven't, I don't, I don't feel, there's just, I think this is one big thing John and I have in common. John would have left, John would have left <laughs> so much earlier. But we just, the idea of creating something new, like right now I have this new mechanic that I know nobody's done and I'm obsessed with it. And I'm, you know, I'm toying with it like a cat has a mouse. Like, okay, what am I going to do with this thing, you know? And um, yeah, so it's, I'm, I'm for, 
I'm still I'm I'm still for now done with swords. I'm not. <laughs> although probably that said, when I do a 6502 game, it'll be a traditional RPG. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'll close it. I'll begin begin and end with a sword. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I'm acutely aware of the time here. I know you've got other commitments so we've got about 10 minutes or so left. Yeah. So what I'll do is I wanted to just switch to some viewer questions to, to get some answers for them. We haven't even got as far as Doom. Your, your careers are so rich and <laughs> long. There's no way we could squeeze all of this into an hour. So. You know, there is, when John interviewed um, uh, Don Daglow, uh, I remember he came back literally after an entire day Right. And Don's career, John, Don's career actually starts in the 70s. Yeah. And John comes back and he's like, we got to 1976. It was oh, great. Wow. I'm like, Jesus, what are you going to do? Move in with him for a year, you know? So, yeah. So, you know, what we, you know what we're up against. Yeah. So uh, first question, then we'll do some quick fire questions. Then uh, Chrissy asks, uh, excluding the PC, what's your favorite Doom port? This goes to both of you. Well, I'd say the PlayStation. Yeah, PlayStation? the PlayStation okay. 4 was really great. Yeah, Brenda, do you yeah. have a if favorite we're talking, one? If we're talking specific ports, like any kind of weird port, I love the, the printer port. Oh, yes. Where yeah. they, they basically took over and bricked a printer to prove that security was flawed um, and installed Doom on it. And all that printer does now is run Doom. I, <laughs> those type of, I am so for all those weird creative <laughs> ports. I love it. Uh, J James asks, um, from the book Masters of Doom, are there any inaccuracies that you'd like to have cleared up or missing moments that you feel should have been in to enhance the story? Wow. Um, that book is basically all correct. Um, okay. There's, there's probably like little details that might not be correct. Overall, though, everything in the book happened. And uh, there's unbelievable amounts of detail missing because it's 300 pages to tell uh, years of story. And there was, you know, in one single year of doom, you could fill a thousand page book. So um, yeah, there's tons missing, but that's, it's, it's a book made for, it's a popular book made for an audience. That's not all game dev, you know, it's like anybody that's interested in the story of doom's development, um, you know, because they played doom or heard about it. Yeah, there was talk of a TV series being made about it. Is there any more news about that? Do we know if that's happening? I think it's canned. Oh, yeah, okay. I, think it's, I know a pilot was done. I think it was canned. I, I happened to catch an image last night from it. It was, it was surreal because I'm like, I don't recall that picture of John, <laughs> but it was the picture of Eduardo, who I don't think looks very much like John, although I was grateful that he is also native, so that so that at least culturally it, it that's right. Yeah, but there's a picture of I'm guessing Eduardo behind real Eduardo, where he looks like teenage early twenties John. But when I first saw the picture, I'm like, I wonder what picture that is of John. I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then I showed it with John. It's really it's, I, I posted it to our kids to see if they said they did. They didn't say anything about it, but I was hoping to fool them. They didn't. They didn't even reply. They to didn't really yeah. traditional, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what you get as a parent. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I'd love to see it happen. Let, let's uh, let's make some noise, uh, the, the viewers, to try and I make know. that show happen. <laughs> um, next question, Matthew. John, do you regret saying that the Amiga was incapable of running Doom? Well, it was. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Um, that's uh, read, If you read uh, Amiga history books, the history books say that the death of the Amiga, they're going to just kind of blame Doom for because everybody left to play Doom. Like, everyone went and got a PC because, yeah, this has really cool graphics, but there are graphics with chips that were limited to the, the you know, the console era of the 16-bit SNES and the Genesis type stuff. It was, you know, like, I have a home computer that can do consoles from the, you know, from the, um, the 80s. But, um... Doom was a completely new thing. You know, Wolfenstein and Doom are the, the start of a whole new genre. And the way that you got the image on the screen fast had nothing to do with the the hardware that those that, that the Amiga had in it. Um, so they had to be drawn completely differently, which was very CPU bound and would make a sixty eight thousand crawl. To make to make Doom go really fast, you had to use a special chain for VGA mode. Um, you had to be a really good assembly language programmer. Um, it was not something that, well, no one else had done it. So obviously you couldn't have a whole bunch of these games on an Amiga. 
So, uh, so anyway, yeah, that was it. That was the popular game had shifted to the 3D shooter and the Amiga was not made for 3D. No regrets then. And it's exactly what I did. I saw Doom, I ditched my Amiga and I bought a PC. So. Um, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Reese asks, from someone who's worked with his partner in the past and finds himself in that situation again currently, what was it like working together on Empire of Sin? Does having that personal relationship make the process easier or can it create issues, i.e. did you find it hard to switch off at the end of the working day? I, th I think... John and I are not normal in that both of our lives are 100%. Like, this is really all we've ever done. So I think we don't probably ever really switch off the way normal people would, or we switch off in different ways. But you know, during Empire Sin especially, you know, there were, there were certain periods that were really challenging. And I did because I was working – because it was like – even if you say like, okay, I'm going to work nine to five, my brain is not going to listen to that, right? So my brain is going to continue to do whatever it's doing. So we did have like, let's talk about anything else. Let's let's yeah. do anything else. And John was, John was fantastic about creating a space. Um, you know, even other, even other, like, even creating places of quiet didn't wasn't necessarily tremendously effective because my brain would fill those voids you know, with every single design problem or design challenge that I had going on at the time, just, which is normal to ship a game. So we would even, you know, like work on other projects. Okay, let's, let's do a boxed version of Dangerous Dave. And like, at least my brain's busy, but it's busy with something else, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think, I don't think we've really, we really have had that problem. If anything, like if anything, John and I need like 40 more years to finish everything that we want to do, you know? Yeah, also also owning a company, running a company is a ton of work. You know, when you yeah, have 30, 33 people in a company um, and you don't have a whole bunch of management, it's a lot of work to run a company and to run a game team. Uh, so it takes up your whole life because it's super important. And it's not like if I work for someone else, then when I get home, I can just switch off and go do whatever. It's like, this is everything. <laughs> everything is this company. So, um, so that's why it takes up so much time and, and parts of our lives. And, uh, but we try to make the weekend be completely um, non, you know, non work stuff. If, if it's work, it's our own personal stuff that we want to work on, but we try to switch off for the weekends so we don't get burnt out. Yeah, and John, I would even say, like, for some people, for John, programming is a passion for him. You know, so when we go on vacation, we have a separate, a whole separate metal suitcase for John's computer and his monitor. Uh, and he takes it on every single vacation we go on. And he's, well, I don't know, he did sigil on several vacations. But, you know, for people who are, you, John, you're looking at a human, but he really runs 65 or two. <laughs> you know, for him, for him, the greatest vacation he can have is just doing whatever he wants to do that is creative with code. Or sometimes it's just, you know, playing a hell of a lot of whatever game he's totally into. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. You know, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, we have a so lot of people... I've had, Sorry, yeah. we have a lot of Sorry, people. Ahead, or, we have a lot of people in our office who are basically the same way. If they, if they could just take a coding cruise, or they could just go on a cruise and just code, <laughs> they would absolutely do it. One hundred percent. Yeah, I joke about that. Code this is cruise. this is how you should retire. So uh, a celebrity yeah. coding cruise. Oh. John's the celebrity. <laughs> Brenda's doing a sixty-five oh two in the cabin. It's it's everything you yeah, want. Yeah, perfect. 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 Well, I want to be respectful of your time. We've come up on, on the hour now, so I'll let you get on to your, to your next call. Uh, just that was lovely to chat to you both. Um, where can people go to just find out a bit more about what you're working on now and what you're doing? Just RomeroGames.com or yeah. you can follow us, uh, I think, Twitter. The Romero Games on Twitter. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It's all or social media. BR things. on Twitter for her and I'm Romero on Twitter. Yeah. You, you've yeah. registered that really early, haven't you? Just at BR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The downside of it is it's really easy to remember, but it also means I get probably for every one actual message to me, there's about, you know, a hundred that have nothing Brazil, to do with me. Brazil, Banana <laughs> Republic. Yeah. Banana Republic, Basket <laughs> Robbins. 
there's a German TV station that must have BR as their, you know, their initial. I get, I get tagged in very important German things, <laughs> which I can't read all the time. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you both for your games. Thank you for the joy that you've brought to so many of us through your work. And uh, thank you for answering our questions today. Thank Take care. you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you.